got a question for you. How would you rate yourself when it comes to focusing? Okay, I better repeat that because some of you weren't listening. Okay, how, how would you rate yourself when it comes to focusing? Now, in this series, The Best You Yet, we're talking about six areas of life we need to elevate to elevate our life. And one of the areas that we need to elevate if we're going to be the best we can be is we need to elevate in the area of focusing. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about that between this Sunday and next Sunday in smaller groups. And I'm really excited about how many of you, hundreds and hundreds of you are part of smaller groups. And you watch a short video and there's a book and a, and a discussion and we learn as we engage with others and talk with others. And, and so it happens between Sundays as well as on Sundays for every age and stage of our Bonita Valley family. But we're going to talk about focusing, and it's amazing the studies, and, and I'm always intrigued by brain studies and neurology and, and how we think and why we think and, and our, our bodies we talked about last week. In the series, we've talked about our faith and elevating our faith and our food and how to elevate our food and our, our, what we eat because our food is medicine that's either helping us or hurting us. We talked about fitness, uh, and, and I got word that last week, the, the Zumba class, the numbers were the biggest they had ever had, and people, some were doing the hokey pokey, but they were there, so it was like they, they started to move, and I challenged you last week from the Mini Habits book, just do one push-up, just one, or just get down to the floor, just start there, just, just, do, just do one stupidly small step in the direction you want to go, because once you're in motion, an object in motion will continue in motion until something else moves on it. It just gets you moving. So we talked about how significant our bodies are. But this idea of focusing in our brains, in fact, they tell us, and, and scientists who study our brains tell us, that we cannot fully focus on more than one thing at a time. In fact, an MIT neurologist by the name of Earl Miller writes, Trying to concentrate on two tasks causes an overload of the brain's processing capacity, especially when people are trying to perform similar tasks at the same time, such as writing an email and talking on the phone. They compete to use the same part of the brain. Trying to carry too much, the brain simply slows down. Multitasking is possible. Multi-excellence while multitasking is not. Now, I know some of you go, you don't know me. I am great at multitasking. You might be great at doing a lot of things, but you won't be great at any of those things. Because multitasking, while it does a lot of things, you can't focus on a lot of things and be great at a lot of things. Because your brain can only fully focus on one thing at a time. That's why I like the, there's so much about don't drive and, and, and text or don't drive and talk because it operates the same parts of the brain that need to be working. I've witnessed people driving and doing all kinds of things. How many of you, I, I've seen people do, I've seen them driving while they're eating, driving while they're changing clothes on the way to the golf course. Maybe that was me. But I, I've seen, I saw, I saw, true story. A couple of months ago, ago, I'm driving home, it's nighttime, it must be like 10 o'clock, it's dark. And when I'd stop at a light, the person behind me would stop, and then they would turn the light on because it would catch my eye, the rearview mirror. And I noticed the lady behind, every time we stopped, she was putting on makeup, every, every time. She'd lift up her light, and, and I'm like, where's she going at this time? Because we're not heading like downtown. And then I'm like, I better get in a different lane in case she gets something in her eye, right? Like, I didn't trust somebody putting on their makeup, following me. And then, true story, I'm not making this stuff up because when I'm speaking on something that's in my head and my heart and I'm watching for it, so I'm, I'm thinking about driving and how you can't drive and do other things. And so I'm driving home again. This week, Thursday night, I'm driving home. It's, kind of, it's dark, it's kind of late. I pull up to turn left at a, at, a, at a light, waiting in the line, and a car pulls beside me. And I'm always kind of aware of who's around me, so I glance over at the car beside me. And I noticed that the person, because they, 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 they were messing with their phone, they had their phone like stuck to the windshield on like this like, kind of neat holder, like right underneath the, the rear view mirror. And I thought, you know, that's kind of cool. I don't know I've really seen that. It's probably navigation, but it wasn't navigation. They were watching a movie on their phone. Like, and, 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 and I look over and I'm like, that's not a map. And like there's action and stuff going on. And I'm like, that person's watching a movie. 
And the reason I know they were watching the movie was the light turned green. I left, I looked back, they're still watching the movie. Now, okay, like, like, you can't watch a movie successfully and drive successfully. Now, you can do both part way, but you can't be excellent at both at the same time. So all of you who think that you can multitask and be great, that's a myth. You can do a lot of things, but you can't not do a lot of things in a great way at the same time. Some of you may remember there's like an old statement, kind of when I grew up, it was kind of pretty well known, may not be as known today, but the phrase was, a jack of all trades, master of none. A person who could do a lot of different things, they weren't super skilled at any of them, but they had a lot of skills. And here's what's really important, and, and that's, that's, a, that's a good thing, but what's really important is, and, and here's kind of a principle of focus, it's, so, that, that, that it's really critical. To be a master or excellent at anything means focusing on less so that we can accomplish more. A principle of focusing is you will accomplish more when you focus on less. In fact, Tim Cook, who's the CEO of, of Apple, Apple, company, Apple, Apple Computer Company now, he, he talked to his company's shareholders and, and listen carefully to what he tells them. He says, we are the most focused company that I know of or have read of or any knowledge of. We say no to good ideas every day. We say no to great ideas. Listen. In order to keep the amount of things we focus on very small in number so we can put enormous energy behind the ones we choose to do. The table each of you is sitting at today, you could probably put every product on it that Apple makes. Yet last year, our company's revenue was $40 billion. Apple is an amazingly profitable, successful, effective company. And they make such few numbers compared to other companies, and it's a key to their success. Because the most effective companies focus on fewer things so they can put their energy and effort in fewer things and accomplish. If you focus on less, you can accomplish more. It's not only true of companies, it's true of people. It was true of the Apostle Paul. In fact, he gives this very idea. Watch carefully. In your Bibles, notes on the screens, Philippians 3, verse 13. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I, what? Focus. Circle that word. I focus on this, what? One. Okay, all right, focus. There's two words I want you to circle. Focus and one. Don't miss them. One thing, forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race, receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Whatever your focus rating is, how many want to elevate it? Because when you elevate your focus, you elevate your life. Now, somebody missed the question. Let me try it again. Whatever your focus level is, and that's one of the reasons, like, even, even in a room like this, it's so important, and, and, and movement and things that happen, and people that, like, where you sit, whatever your focus level is, if you want to take your life to the next level, you got to take your focus to the next level. And I want to give you three biblical and practical principles for how do I raise my level of focus in life so that I can live the best life I've ever, ever experienced. And I want to give you three. I want you to write them down. So here's the first one in your notes. We elevate our life by focusing our time. I want you to write the word time. I've shared with you previously that time is our most valuable commodity. Uh, many people think it's money or it's this or that. Listen, you can always make more money, but you can't make more time. Time is the most precious commodity that we have, and it's just that. It's a commodity. In fact, Moses understood that, and he prayed about it, and, and he praised this in Psalm 90. Verse 12, Lord, teach us to number our what? Days. He doesn't say our years, how old are you? No, he says our days, not even our weeks or months, our days. And recognize how few, you want to circle the word few, they are. Help us to spend them. There's another word to circle, spend them as we should. Like there's a couple of words again, and, and sometimes when you listen and write and circle, you're focusing. 
you and I aren't in control of the, the, quanti the, the, the quantity that we have, but the quality of our days is dependent on what we spend them on. And, and Moses wanted wisdom. He first of all said, God, help me understand how few my days are, how fast they go, how quickly they go. Now, it was years ago that I ran across this little life chart done by a, a Christian author and writer. His, his name is Dr. Dr. Leslie Weatherhead. And he mathematically calculated the lifetime of a person of, of 70 years. Now, I know today a lot goes 90s and beyond, but he just calculated 70 years. And he took your age and equated it to hours of one day. Just to kind of show you, if your life was lived in one day, where would I be based on my, my age? And I want to show it to you. We'll put it on the screens, and you can just kind of figure out where you fit. If you're 15, it's 10.25 a.m. If you're 20, it's 11.34 a.m. 25, it's past noon. It's 12.42. If you're 30, it's 1.51. If you're 35, it's 3 p.m. If you're 40, it's 4.08 p.m. 45, it's 5.16. If you're 50, it's 6.25 if you're 55, it's 734. 60, it's 842. 65, it's 951. If you're 70, it's 11 p.m. If you're over 70, and many of you, it, it's prime time and bedtime. Okay, so, because a lot of folks, so where are you? It's amazing how fast a day goes and how fast a life goes. And one of the things that, that Moses prayed is, God, help me understand how few I have, how, 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 quickly, how, how quickly time goes by, because I can't make more time, but I can make the most of my time. I make the most of my time when I understand that my, I spend my time. Now, I don't have time to go. We've gone on this in, in previous studies and messages where Paul says, make the most of every moment. And what he's saying is, use your clock time to buy moments. You all have clock time, chronos time, chronological time. And we have keros time, which is moments, it's events. And Paul says, buy events with your clock time. So how do we how do, we do that? How do, I, how do I spend my time in the wisest way so that I can make the most of my life? And I'm going to give you four choices that help us make really good spending decisions when it comes to our time. Okay, four things I want you to write down, very, very important. And I try to practice these four things. I want you to write them down. When you and I have options and choices about how to spend our time, here's four choices we have. First one, choice number one, dump it. Not every choice is a good one. Not every opportunity is the right one. Not every invitation, not every party, not every, not every call that you get, not every email, text, not everything is the best thing for us. And one of the most important ways to make the most of our time is to learn how to say no. Okay, we're going to practice that. It's a very empowering word, all right? I want everyone in the room together, on, we're going to say no out loud. It, 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 you feel so powerful. Okay, here we go. Say no. See, that's why you're a kid. Before they say mommy, dad, they go no. They just like saying No. There's something in power. So I just want to tell you, the Bible talks about let your yes be yes and your no, no. Those are boundary words. If you don't set your boundaries, somebody else will. So you have to have the ability to set boundaries with time. And that means you will never make the most of your time. You'll never spend it in the wisest way if you don't learn how to say no to lesser things. If you don't say no to lesser, you will not have the time to say yes to better. So there's always got to be the ability to say no to things. Now, for some people in this room, like don't raise your hands, their problem with saying no is FOMO, F-O-M-O, fear of missing out. <laughs> if I say no, I'll miss something. Yes, you will. But if you say yes to everything, you'll miss the best things. Are you with me? Here's what Scripture says. Watch this. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything's permissible, he repeats, but not everything is, say it out loud, constructive. It won't build into my life. This was a saying that went around Corinth, everything's permissible, and they're kind of talking about legalism and, and licentiousness, being able to do whatever, do nothing. Plus, so, oh, understand this. As a believer, we have lots of freedom. 
There's a lot of things I can do that, that, that are permissible. They're, they're not against God's law. I can do them. But not everything I can do, listen, not everything I can do should I do. Because some things will just fill my life, but they won't fulfill my life. Some things will fill my schedule, but they won't make my life. So the Bible says you and I need to understand how to, so let me just get specific for a moment, because it's like, how does this really work? So it means sometimes I say no to watching TV. I say no to online time. I say no to emails. I say no to Facebook. I say no to social media. I say no to, 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 to extra work. I say no to some things so I can say yes to better things. I can say yes to God moments. I can say yes to growing moments. I can say yes to relationship moments, to family moments, to friendship moments, to fitness moments, to, to fun moments. I need a lot of things in my life to be healthy, and I can't make that time. I find that time by saying no to other things. One of them is distractions, so important. And I, I study this because you know, I, have to do, I do a lot of writing, a lot of different things. And I've learned that the distractions, and this is one that the things neurologists have discovered, that when you're distracted and you're doing something and, and you stop to answer an email, and you go, I'll get right back to it. When you come back to it, it takes 30 minutes for your mind to engage at the level it was before you stopped. 30 minutes. You don't go right back to it at the same level of concentration. And that's why, like, for me, even when I want to pray, like, how, how many of you, any of you, I thought I'm going to get along with God and I'm going to pray. I never hear my watch ticking until I'm going to pray. And then all of a sudden I hear my watch and I start tapping my toe and I start singing a country song. Okay, like, like it just, the things just all go together. So when I'm writing or praying or I've, I've really got to focus, I turn, I turn my phone off, I turn email off, I turn everything off, I, I put my watch somewhere else. Because if I'm going to be the best, I've got to, I've got to say no to a lot of things to say yes to fully focus. Let me give you the second word. First one is dump it. Here's choice number two. To make the most of our time, delegate it. Choice number two, delegate it. Delegating is not about giving away our job so we don't have a job. No, delegating is about giving away things others can do as well as we do, maybe even better than we do, to maximize our time, our life, their time, their life. Delegating maximizes Moses learned the art of delegation, and it is an art, from his father-in-law, Jethro. Now, you know the story. It won't take a lot of time. Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt, and his father-in-law comes to see him as they're kind of on their way. He just observes his son-in-law, Moses, and from morning till evening, he sits there resolving people's issues. And when you got two million people, there are a lot of issues, because everybody's got issues. So they had all kinds of gripes and issues and problems and things that came up. And so Moses is like, well, you're the leader, so, so I'll answer this. Like even after the first service, someone came up to me about an issue, and it's like it's not the area that I handle, so I directed them towards somebody else because no one person handles every. But they all stood in line for Moses. And, and his father-in-law watched as Moses was getting fried, and the people were getting frustrated. And he goes, Moses, what you're doing is not good. I got, I got, a, I got another plan. What, what are you? And so he gives him a delegating plan. I want to show you. Watch it. It's found in, in the, book of, the book of Exodus, and, and we'll pick it up with verse 21, chapter 18 on the screens. Jethro says to Moses, select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men, hate dishonest gates. So find, find quality people, integrity people. Appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges or arbitrators for the people at all times. But have them bring every difficult case, know when to act and when to pass it up to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves, that will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you'll be able, I love these two phrases, to stand the strain. And all these people will go home satisfied. See, here's my question for you. What are you doing that you could give away? In fact, there are others who could do it if you just ask. They might do it as good or better than you do it, but you have this idea that you've got to do it all, but you don't have time to do it all. You must do less to accomplish more. And one of the ways you do less is not just by saying no because it has to get done, but finding somebody else to do that so you can specialize in an area that they can't do that you, that you have to own. It's your primary. It's what's most important for you. Now listen, everybody in this room, you are a leader. 
You go, no, I don't lead anything. No, no, you do, because every, the word leadership just means influence, and you influence. The first person you've got to lead is yourself, and that's the toughest person is to lead is us. But every one of us are influencers. And there are things that we can have others do, we can delegate, but there are things that you can't delegate. As a leader, I can't delegate away praise or criticism. You can't say, go tell that person they did a good job. You tell them. If you're going to lead them, influence it, you tell You can't say, go correct them for me. No, you, you have to do that. See, someone, uh, I'll give the prizes and you take care of the bat. No, no, the leader, the leader has to do both. The leader has to understand what their gift, their shape is. And, and i gotta, I got to excel in the areas God has equipped and gifted me. What, what do I need to do? The, 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 the risky choices I don't give to somebody. No, it's, it's, my, it's my decision. But I've got to look at my life and say, what am I called and equipped to handle? And what can I delegate? What can I share with others? Because you'll never multiply your time unless you delegate responsibilities, actions, as you share it with others. Let me give you a third word to write down. Here's a third choice. Choice number three, defer it. Defer it. Have you discovered that not every moment is the right one? How many of you have figured out in your relatively fast life that timing is everything? That the right thing at the wrong time doesn't work. So we not only need a right plan, we need the right timing for the plan. And I want to show you that right out of Scripture. Jesus' immediate family on one occasion was, was pressuring him to, to go to Jerusalem, do a festival, to, to do miracles in the big city instead of out of the countryside in Galilee. Let everybody see who you are. And I think it was not just a challenge, it was a bit of a taunt. And I want you to watch how Jesus responds to this opportunity, this call. Watch. John 7, verse 6. Jesus said, this isn't my, what? Time. It's your time. It's always your time. You have nothing to lose. See, the more you have to lose, the more critical timing is. You go ahead, go up to the feast. Don't wait for me. I'm not ready. Watch this. It's not the right time for me. Timing is everything. Now, I don't have time to give you the context of all this, this whole statement, but if you continue to read, Jesus does go to the feast, but not in their time, not in people's time, but in God's time, not in people pressure time, but in God's plan time. The Bible's so full of timing, in the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, in the fullness of time. And, and there were so many, th Jesus was so aware of the timing of God that, that he was like, this is not the time to go. So he did not say no. He doesn't dump it. He doesn't delegate it. He defers it. Now let me just give you a quick qualifier here. Deferring it is not procrastinating. Okay? Procrastinating is a weight problem. <laughs> I don't mean pounds. I mean like we wait and we wait because we can't pull the trigger. Ever heard someone who's aiming to, aiming to, aim? they just never fire. Okay, so no, no, no. no. Procrastinating never gets anything done. Deferring is a timing plan. I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it at the right time. And because this is not the right time, I'll defer it to the best time. There are conversations to have, but how many figured out there's the right times for right conversations? And you can have a conversation that's very important at the wrong time and it blows up. Is it the right time? Come on, how many of you, when you were a kid and you wanted to ask your parent for something, you were very good at figuring out the right time? When you wanted your parent to sign your report card, you made sure they were very busy. They just signed it, right? But when you really needed something, so, so as kids, man, kids know this is not the right time. So don't lose that discernment of, of timing. So some things we have to defer because the time is not right. Let me give you the fourth, fourth choice. Choice number four, do it now. I want you to write those three words. They will change your life. They will change other people's lives. Do it now. James 4, 17, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. You know, hold on, I thought sin was sleeping around, or sin is lying, or sin is cheating, or stealing. Yeah, it is. But sin basically means missing God's target. And when I don't do now, 
the good I should do now, do it now. I miss that moment. And listen, I'm not telling you that there won't be other moments, but you will never have that moment again. There really are now or never moments. Life is full of them. And what I do with that moment can change the course of my life and others. Do it now. There's certain things that now is the time. Now is the Jesus set his face for now is the time. So you got to have discernment about timing. And when it's the right time, you go for it. Doesn't mean it, you're going to risk. There's all kinds, but you go for it. You do it now. Now it was just last Sunday, and I know because it, several people walked up to me, and and I don't carry my phone, so I'm not distracted on Sundays. But it was during the service last Sunday, Kobe, Kobe Bryant and some others tragically were killed in a helicopter accident. And it shocked the sporting world and many people. And because he, he's known worldwide, so many people and so many different reactions. Now, as a pastor, like my life is filled with dealing with births and deaths and happy moments and tragic moments. And, and I watch people and listen to people. And it's often at the death of someone, and especially when it's, when it's not expected and it's shocking and, and it seems so untimely. And you listen to people and it's like what I should have said and what I should have done and, and I, I needed to do this and people are doing other, because what happens when you see someone's life come to an end and, and it comes to an end, what seems so prematurely is you realize that what I'm gonna say, I better say it now. I don't have guarantees about tomorrow. That's why Moses teach us to number today. The moment you have is this one. And there are things I've got to do now because I may not have another chance to do them. That's one of the things about, about dealing with the finality of when someone dies is I have, I can't increase my, my, my quantity of time, but I can increase my quality of time by how I spend it. And there are moments that we can't miss. There are moments that you feel like I need to talk to somebody about Jesus, do it now. There are moments we've got to make something right with somebody. Do it now. There are moments of investing that you've got to do it now. There are now or never moments. So I, I challenge you, if you want to raise the level of your life, you've got to raise your focus when it comes to time. Now, let me give you a second in your notes. Here's the second key. We elevate our life by focusing our thinking. Mm. Second word I want you to write is thinking. Not only timing, but thinking. Have you ever asked yourself, what was I thinking? If you haven't, you should. The Bible challenges us on a regular basis to think about how and what we're thinking. Let me show you from Scripture. Watch. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Be careful how, circle that word, how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Now, there are people in this room who are fanatical about what you put in your body. You read every label. You are, like, like if, if you are what you eat, you are organic. <laughs> there are others that's like, hey, it's food, whatever it is, I, I, it, it goes in. What's amazing is there are times we are fanatical about what goes in our body, but we're very careless about what goes in our minds. And what goes in your mind changes and affects your life. In fact, I put in your notes, it's, a, it's an older saying, and I'm sure most, if not all, have heard it. But it's important to repeat truths because we learn by repetition. And, and I put it in your notes so you can have it and take it with you if you don't have it written down somewhere. And it simply says, sow a thought, reap an action. So an action, reap a habit. Habits are repeated thoughts, just repetition until your brain develops patterns. So a habit, reap a character. You are what you continually do. That's your character. So a character, reap a destiny. Your thoughts are the seeds of your destiny. What you think matters. Focusing your thought is the key to where you're going, who you're becoming. It's the key to your shape, the shape of your life. And that's why Paul says this. Watch Philippians 4 verse 8. You'll do best by filling, feeding your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. That's Paul's menu for your mind. 
In the Daniel plan, there's menus for your, for your diet, for your food, for what you should put in your body. And Paul says, here's a menu for your mind. I don't have time to give you the whole context. Verse 6, he says, don't worry about anything. He goes, yeah, right. But pray about everything. And with thanksgiving, take it to God. And the God of divine order will guard your heart and mind. Now, here's what I want you to do. Feed your mind. Fill your mind. If you want a life of order and not disorder and chaos, fill your mind. Feed your mind. Now, I think he's not only giving us a menu for our mind. I think he gives us a filter for our thoughts. Because how many have discovered not every thought is a keeper? Come on. Have you ever had a thought and you go like, that's not a good thought? Or a thought that you go like, hey, that is a pretty good thought. Well, how do I know? Filter it. Think about what you're thinking. So please, please focus with me. You can't focus on multiple things. So I start to focus on my thinking. And I think about what I'm thinking. And one of the, one of the studies I was reading talked about one of the dangers especially in our society with multitasking because we have so many phones and all this stuff around us, is we think broadly but very thinly. That we don't think creatively or deeply. We don't think critically. People just think like it's, it's a mile wide and an inch deep because we look at all these things but nothing in depth. So Paul says, think about what you're thinking. And move through this list, and you've got to move through the list and ask yourself some questions. Is it true? So, listen, it's not just fake news. There's fake a lot of stuff. Is it true? I had a few, few years ago, I got, somebody told me about a friend of mine and something bad had happened in their life, and, and I wondered, is that true? So I called my friend. Like, I'm not just going to have somebody tell me, if, if I can track it, track it down. And it's like, no, it wasn't true. I'm glad I called them because what I was told wasn't true. How many things do you check out? Be an investigator. Think for yourself. Ask questions. Go after multiple sources. Is it, is it true? Is it noble? Is it valuable is what it really means? Is it reputable? Is it proven and tested? Is it authentic? Is it real? Is it motivating, compelling? I mean, where does, it, where does it move me? Does it make me better or worse? Is it full of grace and love? Great thoughts fuel a great life. And unhealthy thoughts make us unhealthy. But here's the deal with unhealthy thoughts. How many have figured out that, that unhealthy thoughts are sticky? Like they stick in our heads. Now, have you ever told yourself, don't think about that? Have you ever said, okay, don't think about that? And that's all you can think about. Because here's the principle. This is a principle. It's very, very important. That what we resist persists. Okay? What I resist persists. The more I say, don't think about that, I think about it. So the Bible's plan to get rid of a sticky thought we don't want is not resistance. The Bible doesn't say resist it. The Bible says replace it. Don't resist it. Replace it. In other words, the way I get rid of a thought I don't want is by replacing it with a, a newer, bigger, better thought. Now, parents do this all the time, wise parents with children. How many of you have kids? Okay, admit it. Okay, you got kids? <laughs> when they were little especially, when they were little, and, and your child grabbed a hold of something they should not have. Now, as a parent, you've got strength, you've got the ability to pry their chubby little fingers off, and, and when you do, they'll scream like bloody murder, like you're the worst parent ever. So parents have learned how, because you, you hate going through that all the time. So they, parents learn that instead of prying their fingers off and just taking it away from them, you offer them something else, the shiny new thing. And it's amazing how that little one will, will drop that and go for that. Because the best way is not by resistance, it's by replacement. And God's word is full of replacement thoughts. They're the biggest, best, highest thoughts we could ever have. David says, I, I hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I have sinful thoughts, but when your word fills my mind, it, it protects me. I challenge you to be someone who memorizes God's word. You can't do well at memorizing. Focus, you can. And, and, and when, I'm, when I'm afraid, David said, when I'm afraid, I will trust in you. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Don't play with sin. Run from, flee from immorality. Flee from sin. Run from, 
There's no temptation taking you, but what's common to everyone else, and God will make a way of escape. God, I want that escape in my life. That every time I confront anything that, that's a thought in my mind, God will give me another bigger, better thought. The way to get rid of a bad thought, there's no room for it because I got a new thought. And our minds are renewed by the thoughts, listen, that we focus on. So focusing our minds is vital to raising the level of our life. We focus our thoughts and experience God's best for us. Now let me give you the third. Quickly in your notes. Here's number three. We elevate our life by focusing our ambitions. By focusing our time, focusing our thoughts, focusing our ambitions. Watch Philippians 3 verse 10. Paul writes, how changed are my what? Ambitions. Now I long to know Christ and the power shown by his resurrection. Now I long to share his suffering, even to die as he died, so that I might perhaps attain as he did the resurrection from the dead. Now listen carefully. Ambition is not an unspiritual word. A lot of people, well, they're just ambitious. Good. The word ambition or ambitious means to have a strong desire, a drive to succeed, to excel, to acquire. Ambition is not a bad word. It's not an unspiritual word. In fact, I believe, my, my opinion, that God finds most of us don't have enough ambition. Not too much. See, it's not ambition that's bad. Ambition is good. Nothing great happens without great ambition. Because ambition is drive, ambition is desire, ambition is going after something, ambition is a desire to have something, and we never have great things if you don't have a desire and ambition for it. The key to ambition is what are you going after? The drive is great, but, but what's my destination? What makes my drive positive or negative is where I'm going with it. And that's why scripture challenges us to be ambitious for the right thing. Paul was always ambitious. He didn't stop being ambitious when he got saved. He just became ambitious for a whole, a whole better list. He was ambitious to get rid of the name of Jesus. Now he's ambitious to share the name. He was still ambitious. He was a driven man. That's why he changed the world. He's still changing the world. Because God changed his ambitions. How did God change his ambitions? Paul tells us. He gives us two ways that God elevates our ambitions and he elevates our life. I want you to write them down. We're going to do this quickly. Here's, here's the first one in your notes. Our ambitions are changed and elevated when our core values are changed and elevated. The words I want you to write are core values. The most important values of your life. Paul shows us this. Watch Philippians 3 verse 7. Christ has shown me that what I once thought was what? Valuable. Is what? Worthless. He's shown me the value or lack of value of what I valued. Watch. Tony Campolo, Anthony Campolo writes, sometimes I have the feeling that somebody's gone through our world and switched the price tags on everything. Things that ought to be treated as precious, like family, friends, faith, are inconsequential. And things like a new BMW, a membership in the country club, the climb up the corporate ladder, are all too often considered of great importance. I find people working and slaving and spending their money and their time on things that really don't matter at ignoring the things that do. You can't be ambitious for everything. You must focus your ambition. You must say no to some things and say yes to the best things. So here's my simple question for you. Are the things you're valuing valuable? Is what captures your dreams, your heart, because wherever your treasure is, your heart goes there. Are those treasures worth your heart? Are they worth your life? That's the question. The Bible has a lot to say about values, but is what I'm valuing really valuable? And how do I know? I'll tell you how you know. In this world and the next, what is valuable is what lasts. Okay? Like when it comes to money, the financial seminar, appreciating assets are better than depreciating assets. In other words, if you buy something and the value goes up, I just saw a thing, true story, and I watched it because it was funny. I heard about it and I watched it. And if you ever see this, like, I think it's a PBS thing where people come and they bring like stuff, old stuff, and a guy tells you what it's worth. I don't, know what I don't even know what the show's called, but it's just like antique road trip. There it is. Like, I don't even know. But I, 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 so, so this guy, he's like in his 70s, and he brings a watch. He bought a Rolex watch back in 1971. He buys a Rolex watch for 340 some bucks. True story. 
Never wears it because it didn't look too nice, so he puts it in a safety deposit box. So he brings it to the antique roadshow. And the guy starts telling him all about it. Well, okay, I'll cut right to it. It's now worth $700,000. He passes out. He falls on the ground. <laughs> they get him back up. He, he paid 340 some bucks, and it's now worth $700,000. Okay, I mean, that was a good buy. <laughs> I mean, if you bought a watch for 50 bucks, it's now worthless. <laughs> so... It's all about appreciation or depreciation. Does the value go up or go down? So how do you know what to invest in? Here's what, invest in what lasts, not just in this life, invest in what's eternal. And there's only two things in this life that will be in the next life, okay? There's only two things in this room that will be in the next life, in eternity, and that is the word of God. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words, my will, my ways will never pass away, and people. Everything else here is temporary, but people are eternal. We have an eternal spirit. So the values of my life need to center around the will and ways of God and relationships. Nothing else will last. Nothing else will matter. If it's not eternally valuable, it's eternally useless. So we got to weigh value based on eternity. And and, and then here's the second one in your notes. Here's the second key. Our ambitions are changed and elevated when our ultimate prize is changed and elevated. Ultimate prize. Not just what I value, but the prize I go after. Philippians 3.13, no dear brothers and sisters, and if you were focusing earlier, we already read this. I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead. I can't look in all directions at once. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the, what kind of prize? Heavenly. Paul was eternity focused. And not just the prize for me, but for all of us that God is calling. God has an eternal prize for every one of us. The question is, is the prize you're after in this life or the next? I can say no to the temporary to say yes to the eternal. And so I have to have, in fact, one of my favorite ways of saying it comes from C.S. Lewis. I'll put it on the screens. Aim at, focus on heaven, and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at, focus on earth, and you get neither. So where's your focus? I want to end with two questions I began with. So how would you rate your focusing? And whatever your focus level is, do you want to elevate it? To have the best life, you got to have the best focus. To have the best focus, you need to understand that you can't focus on everything successfully. I've got to say no to some things to say yes to other things. I've got to focus on less to do more, and there are three ways I do that. I do that, first of all, when I understand that I elevate my life by focusing my time. Your time is the most valuable commodity you have. Is it focused? Dump it. Delegate it. Defer it. Do it now. You've got to make the best choices with your time to make the best life you can have. I now need to focus on my time. If I'm going to elevate my life, I need to focus on my thinking. What was I thinking? Because your thinking is shaping your destiny. So you and I need to become the best thinkers that we can possibly be. And Scripture challenges us to how to think and what to think and to filter our thoughts and to aim and direct our thoughts. And when you have a bad thought, don't resist it, replace it. And then finally, you and I need to be ambitious. Ambition is a good thing. Nothing great happens without great ambition. Great ambition is just drive and determination. It is just the desire to go after it. And God doesn't find our ambition too strong. Most times, he finds it too weak. It's just, what am I going after? I need to elevate my values. I need to elevate my pride. I need to value what's really valuable, what's eternal, and I need to prize what's in heaven and not on earth because those prizes will not fade away. 
And when you and I improve our focus, we will improve our life. Let's pray. God, help us to take this whole series about being the healthiest, best us we can be. And help us today to focus. If you've never received Jesus as the leader of your life, right where you sit, you can pray a simple prayer. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me for choices of trying to be my own God. Thank you for paying the price for my failures in my life. And I will follow you with my whole heart. Simple prayer can make an eternal difference. And I pray for so many in their businesses, in their families, in their life, in their retirement, in their college years, in their school days, that you would make us a people who, who raise the level of our focus and raise the level of our life in Jesus' name.